What's up and welcome back to Reform Perspective. Thanks for joining us. Today's video is going to be talking a little bit about my Reform faith. And I'm going to share a little bit more of why why I am a Calvinist. I know I've, I've done a video, but it was very short. It was very brief. Um, I want to go a little bit more in depth this time. I've done a couple of videos on total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. I've done these videos before, but now I kind of want to do like more of a face-to-face -face and... Uh, and kind of share a little bit more scripture verses with you guys. Um, I grew up as a Calvary Chapel guy and, and, and grew up with Calvary Chapel theology, you know, dispensationalism, uh, pre-tribulation, pre-millennialism. I grew up with uh, an Arminianist type of, of theology, even though they claim that it's not Arminian nor Calvin, it's like this middle thing, but it's more Arminian than anything. Um, even though they want to admit, no, I'm not an Armenian, I'm not an Armenian, but their theology is. And a lot of the times I've, I've noticed that, especially with the Hispanic community, they have no real answers for for predestination or for God's sovereignty. And and, and my, the Reformed faith, I feel, like just has the, the most consistent answers uh, to give to anybody who has questions regarding these things. And so the reason I'm doing this video is because I want to I want to encourage young Hispanic men to not only look into the Reformed faith, but also to heed um, some of the answers that men like uh, like John Piper and James White and uh, John MacArthur and Paul Washer and Matt Chandler, the, the, these guys that are all part of the Reformed faith. I want you to hear the answers that they give in regards to um, the apologetics of the Reformed faith. And I think that, um, especially when I hear a Reformed theologian like James White doing apologetics, his answers are always consistently the same. They never have to beat around the bush of the text. They never have to try to eisegete information into the text. It's always just reading the text and allowing the text what it says. Now I know we have our traditions. I have my tradition as a Reformed faith. It's my tradition, but... When I approach the text, I try to allow the text to say what it's trying to say and not try to read into the text what I think it's trying to say. And so because I'm reformed because when I read the scripture, I'm extracting information and extracting truths from the scripture without having to read anything into it. So when I approach Romans chapter 9, uh, Romans chapter 8, Ephesians chapter 1, John chapter 6, John chapter 10. When I approach these texts, I can just read them and recognize God's sovereignty and God's uh, predestining and God's and God's glor self-glorification in all of those texts. I don't have to read anything into it. And I feel like a lot of the times when I'm talking to my Arminian or Calvinian or whatever they want to call themselves, Whenever I talk to my brothers and sisters of the faith about these things, their worldview is is unable to answer these questions a lot of the time consistently. They have to try to bring philosophy and uh, other ideas into the text to be able to try to make sense without just allowing the text to say what it's trying to say. Um, and so uh, I just want to kind of share with you guys a couple of scripture verses about why I'm part of the Reformed faith. Now, I've heard it said before that the Reformed faith, that's a white man's faith. <laughs> no, I don't think it is. I don't think it's a white man's faith at all. I mean, I know a lot of the Hispanic community um, doesn't even get exposed a lot of the time to the Reformed faith. And I'm very grateful for, for men such as James White, John Piper, all the men that I've um, mentioned before. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that they do the work that they do because um, it, it allows men like me to be able to go and, and search this truth for myself and come to my own conclusions. Of course, through the illumination of the Holy Spirit and through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit has used men like this in my life to bring me to the truth of scriptures. Now, I'm not saying that the Arminian and the, 
the Calvary Chapel guys, they're not believers. No, of course, they're all my brothers and sisters in faith. But I think, I think, especially for Hispanic men, I think it would be good if we start really thinking through theology. Um, a lot of the time, um, especially more of the Spanish-speaking community, los, los que hablan español, um, they, they have a really bad view of theology a lot of the time. They think that theology is just me and my Bible, and that's not it. We, I recognize that the Holy Spirit and God has given us 2,000 years of church history to be able to give to us tools and information and godly men, God-fearing men, all throughout church history that have been able to, um, to be able to help us to understand the scriptures better. And our, and our belief systems today have been handed down to us, whether you're Arminian or Calvinian or Calvary Chapel or Reformed or um, any of the other heresies, <laughs> all of those are given to us through the years, through these 2,000 years. And if you say, no, the reason that I believe what I believe is because I read the Bible and that's what I believe, that's what I've come to believe then you're blind to your own tradition. And I agree with James White when he says, the man who does not see his own tradition is a slave to his tradition because he's unwilling to see his own worldview as the means by which he is interpreting the scripture. And so I think it's important. Um, yes, I do have a tradition. Yes, it's Calvinism. But my Calvinism, my Reformed faith, is not me trying to read into the text of scripture what I think it's trying to say, the reason I'm Reformed, again, is because I've approached the Scripture, allowed the Scripture to say what it's trying to say, and then extracting it and saying, Reformed faith makes more sense. All right, so let's go look at the Scriptures real quick. So this is in Ephesians chapter 1. This is classic, a classic text that I think is one of the most influential texts for the Reformed faith. Ephesians 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So this we are doing, or Paul is doing according to the will of God. Not to Paul's own will, but to the will of God. To the saints who are Ephesus and who are a faith in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, this is where we get into the body of text that I feel um, allows to say what it says according to the Reformed faith. Here it is. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. All right, so we do have blessings by God, our Father, and through the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we receive these blessings? Just as He chose us in Him. All right, so a lot of the times we see or we hear, especially from the non-reform community, they say, yes, he chose us, but he chose us in him. So they say the choosing, the object of the choosing is in him. And I say, no, you're skipping over this right here, this word, this very important word, us. The object of God's choosing, and not according based on our action or free will, because there is no mention of action or free will in these verses, this is all, these are all verses talking about God's will and God's predestining and God's sovereignty. So he chose us. He chose us. That is the object of the choosing. He chose us in him. When? Before the foundation of the world. And you say, well, can't he choose us before the foundation of the world according to our free and autonomous actions? That's not what the text is saying. When we do that, when we approach the text saying, I have free will, God foresees what I'm going to do and then predestines according to my free will, that's bringing into the text something that's not there. The text is not saying that. The text is simply saying he chose us before the foundations of the world to be in him to be in christ that is to be saved that is god's sovereignty in the midst of this text let's go back to the text he chose us to be in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him so 
This is a soteriological, this is a salvific verse. This verse is talking about salvation. And you say, well, then is he, sing is he, some, kind of, is he some kind of robot up there just kind of choosing whenever he wants to choose? No, that's not how he does things. He does things according to his great acts of love and great acts of mercy and great acts of grace. He's not some emotionless robot up there just choosing whenever he wants to. No. He chooses according to his love, as it says here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. In love. In love. This is how he chooses. In his love. Agape. Love that is unhindered. Love that is unconditional. In love. He predestined. Now I say, well, does to predestined really mean predestined? Well, the Greek word is praarizo. Praarizo literally means predetermine or to foreordain. So he predetermined us. He predestined us. Just as he chose us before the foundation of the world, he predestined us. How? In love, in his great love. He predestined us to adoption. He didn't predestine the adoption. He predestined us to adoption. As sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. To the kind intention of his will. Not according to his foreseeing of our actions that's not how he's predestining that's not how he's choosing us he's choosing us according to his love to his kind intentions that's god's sovereignty everything that he does is perfect everything that he does is good everything that he intends to do is lovely and pure and beautiful even choosing those whom he wills to save all right goes on to say why does he do this not for our glory not for our purposes but to the praise of the glory of his grace god god is in the business of god's stuff he's in god things and so god is going to do things to glorify himself not for our glory yes when we are enraptured into his being, when we are chosen into him, we are then made glorious in his sight, but not because we are worth it or because we have some kind of goodness in us that's worth anything. No, we are totally depraved. And because of this, we hate God and we don't want anything to do with God. And yet in his kind intentions for his glorious grace, he predestined us for adoption. He predestined us for adoption. All right. Goes on to say. Which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. He didn't freely bestow the beloved. He freely bestowed on us in the beloved. So the bestowing of the beloved is on us. He freely, he freely. It's not my freeness. It's not I freely bestowed Christ on me. That's not how it goes. And you say, well, there's prevenient grace. God is constantly giving us and freeing our will and freeing our will. Again, that's not in the body of text. He freely, he chose, he predestined us to be in Christ. When we are raised from the grave, that is from spiritual deadness, when we are raised to life by the working of the spirit, by the freedom of the spirit, when we are raised to life, then we willingly come. I'm not saying that we don't have a will. I'm not saying that we don't have a freedom, a limited freedom, because we do have a limited freedom based upon the nature of our being. If we are dead in our sins, then every action that we do will be based upon our deadness. It will be based upon 
our total depravity. But because this, by His grace and by His freedom and by His will, He frees us by regenerating our hearts to be conformed to the image of Christ, and therefore we are made slaves of righteousness. Because of that, we then willingly follow Him. All right? Let's go back to the body of text. All right, it continues to say, In Him we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us. Now, I want you to pay attention how many times Paul purposely talks about He, He, He did it. He gave us. He lavished. His grace, His will, His intentions, His predestining, His choosing, His everything. He's doing this. He's doing all of this. Not based upon the actions of our free will. He's doing it. All right? And He doesn't do it robotically. He does it in great love. He does this lovingly. He says, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. Again, the language and that's being used here by Paul is to make God glorious in his predestining, in his choosing, in his giving, in his grace. That is the whole purpose of these, these verses. With a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heavens and things on the earth. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined, predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will. The predestining is not based on the counsel of our free will, his predestining is based according on the counsel of His will, on God's will, not our will, His will. Do you see what's happening here? And we're going to get here and we're going to see a verse real quick that you say, Aha, see, that, that takes care of everything, but you'll see. To the end, that we who were the first to hope in Christ Jesus, so we are hoping, this is us. This is how we respond to His choosing. This is how we respond to His predestining. Predestining. This is how we respond. We were the first to hope in Christ Jesus would be to the praise of His glory. Again, in Him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, so there is an action that we take upon all the body of the text previous to this. The reality of His choosing, His predestining, His giving, His choosing of us, His lavishing, His you know, revealing of the mysteries of Christ to us. All of these things He does to us and for us and in us and through us so that we would believe. So there is an action that we take but not because we did so based on our own good intentions, on our goodwill and our freedom. No, all of these things are done by His freedom, His goodwill, His intentions, His purposes, His predestining, so that we would be the first to hope and believe. So we do believe, but not because we have the freedom ultimately to do so without His grace giving to us the regeneration of the heart to believe. We just respond to the merciful action and sovereign grace of God. It goes on to say, So having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of of his glory. So it's to the praise of his glory. It's not to the praise of our glory. 
It's not to the praise of our coming to the right decision. It's not to the praise of our coming to making the good choice, making the final decision. He did it. He accomplished. He purposed. He will. He predestined. He chose us in Christ so that we might believe. And it's not a possibility. That word we might believe, it's actually... It means that it will come to pass. And I can get into so many texts of Scripture, and I think I will eventually in the future get into Romans 8, Romans 9, John 6, John 10, especially John 6. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will raise him up on the last day. The giving of the Father results in the coming of the Son, and the coming of the Son results in the raising. The Father doesn't give everyone to the Son, but we'll get to that. So I hope Hispanic men out there, well, really every man out there, will will take heed to this uh, to this video. And if you have questions, post them below. Hit that subscribe button. Um, I appreciate you listening. Hey, listen, man. If you disagree with me, cool. Just type me some questions. Type me some answers, um, and I'll try to answer them as quickly and as soon as possible. Um, but until then, may the Lord richly bless you, keep you always in his loving embrace. Until next time on Reformed Perspective.